First of all, thank you guys for coming out this morning uh, to the uh, Drupal Dallas Summit. Um, it's going to be an exciting weekend, learning all about Drupal, for those of you who are very new to it. Um, as David said, it's a very exciting platform to build your technology on. I'm going to cover a little bit on the power of Drupal, but primarily what my main focus for this uh, keynote is just to go over what really is exciting about Drupal and also what you can do with open source is that you can uh, reflect it onto your business model. Um, as David mentioned, my name is Travis Tidwell. I uh, lead up the web app development team at allplayers.com. I'm going to go into some detail on what All Players is and what we do. Um, I've been there for about two years now. It's uh, been an exciting ride. So I'm going to go a little into detail about that as well. Um, and I'm really excited about this, this presentation uh, for two reasons. One, I'm going to be able to go over Drupal and basically the power of what Drupal can do for you. Uh, because at All Players, we use Drupal and we've used it and we've leveraged it in such a way that we've created an extremely powerful platform built specifically and only on Drupal. It's, a, it's an amazing platform. But not only that, but I'm going to be talking about open source and what open source means to not only your software, but also to your business. And what I love about open source is that it's not just about making software free and sharing software with other people. Open source is a series of values that, that relates to not only open source, but all other aspects of life. In fact, you can actually reflect those values on other places in your life, including businesses. And by reflecting those values on businesses, you create this very open business model that definitely reflects the spirit and values of open source. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today, which is the, the open source business model. Now at allplayers.com, we have employed a business model that is a direct reflection of open source, or what we consider a direct reflection. And it's been, uh, from the very, very get-go, we've, we've had this philosophy of, you know what, we're going to be using Drupal, Drupal's free, Drupal's open source, but there's something very powerful about that. And about that contribution, about that sharing, and about that everyone working together to make a better platform, let's just make that our entire business model. Let's, from the ground up, let's found our business on those values and see what happens. Now, we're not the first people to do this. There's a lot of other companies out there that do it as well, and uh, including Google. Google's probably one of the, the most well-known company that definitely embraces this open source business model. Um, so what I want to do f at, at first is also kind of give you a disclaimer. Now, I'm going to be talking about this open source business model, but in no way is it, do I feel that this is the win-all business model for any, any company out there. There's a lot of other business models that are superior given whatever, whatever industry you're in. However, for software, for what the industry we are in, it was a perfect fit. And so what I'd like to do today is kind of go over what we do that basically makes the, the, um, our business a direct reflection of open source. And it's really exciting. But before I can actually get you familiar with this business model, um, I think it's important for you to understand what All Players is and what, what my company, what we're all about. Um, so the, first of all, the company was founded about two years ago. And our idea was, is we wanted to create a central location to where people and families can, can um, sign up and that they can actually uh, interact with the activities that they are involved in. We noticed that there was this big gap between families and, and how they communicate with the activities they're involved in. And so if you, want to, if you want to actually learn about all players, the best thing that you can do is you can go to our website and our homepage. Um, of course, be logged out because then you'll get, the, uh, you'll get what we call the brochure side of our website. It's a beautiful website. It's uh, completely responsive, so you can look at it on your mobile phone. But this basically tells you everything you need to know. Allplayers.com brings organizations and families together online so that you can spend more time doing the things you love. It's a one-stop convenience to take care of everything you need to get moving. And um, so basically we, we catered this website for a whole series of different people. And we feel that it's, it's so generic enough that you can use it as a parent if you want to manage your family or if you want to manage your, your family calendar. It's a, if in that case, it's a direct replacement for the calendar that goes on your refrigerator. 
Um, it's great for league activities so that we, uh, you know, for uh, leagues that have teams and those teams want to communicate with the parents to tell them that the cancel practice is canceled. It's great for camps. It's great for coaches and leaders. But it is so much more than that. This is what we advertise today because this is what our software has been catered for now. But we've built it in a way that we can actually expand the horizons and introduce this to other markets out there such as Boys and Girls Clubs of America, Boy Scouts, um, dance clubs, dance studios. There's all kinds of markets that we can get in and all, all types of organizations that need this type of tool. We do not consider ourselves a social network. We consider ourselves a tool that you need. The social aspects come as an after, as, as an, as an after effect of people using our tool. And our goal is that the family and also the groups need this tool to basically make their lives a lot easier. So let's say you went over to allplayers.com and you logged in and you created an account. The very first thing that you're going to see is you're going to see this. This is the, this is the user perspective, the, the user-centric part of all players. And this is basically the dashboard, what we call the dashboard, of what the user sees whenever they log in. So everything about this page is about you. It's about your calendar, your messages, your family, your friends, your groups, your photos. Everything is about you. It's, it's all the things that you're involved in collected in a single location that you can manage those things. Um, and so this is the very first thing that you see. And this by itself is a pretty powerful concept. Of course, other, other websites out there have this concept. This is the Facebooks. These are all the other social media sites out there where you're basically, it's all about you and it's about who's connected to you. But where, where All Players really shines and where I feel is a very good testament of the power of what Drupal can do is what we've done for groups and what we've actually molded Drupal to be able to uh, accommodate our group structures. So with our website you're able to go and create a new group and a group is essentially your own website within a website. Now I cannot name another CMS out there where you would be able to do this. This is a true testament of how powerful Drupal CMS is because to be able to create a website within a website to where even you can you can set up administrators where they are the administrators for that space but they're still in the same central website this is what Drupal can do if you combine all the necessary pieces together, all the necessary building blocks. So this is really cool. What the group admin gets, and keep in mind, these, these are not site admins. These are people who create an account and just create a group. They are now the administrator for that group, and they can manage their group space. So we call this space. In fact, we use a module in Drupal called Spaces to do this. And what you actually get is you get a fully customizable group space. You can drag and drop boxes so that you can customize content, you can add images, you can add new pages which end up being new tabs up there at the top, you can change your logo, you can change your own colors. All the groups get their own space which is extremely powerful. But not only that, we've also incorporated this hierarchy structure. So let's say you are the organization owner for the YMCA and you have your YMCA, which you consider a group, and you have hundreds, if not thousands, of groups below your YMCA that you manage. We also allow that to where you could create groups that are essentially below this group that are a subset of it. And each one of those can have their own admins, their own colors, their own content, and everything. And you are able to manage from a top-down perspective. Um, if anybody would, would come to you and said, hey, this is what I want, I want to build a, a website that does this, you would probably tell them that they're crazy because it really is a crazy um, amount of functionality of software that we're actually providing the people that use our site. It's, it's an amazing amount of effort that went into this, but a lot of it was leveraged from the power of Drupal. And this, this, is, this is what you get when you use a well-maintained, uh, and a, a very popular CMS, you get this power, you get this flexibility to do some amazing things. So now, not only does the group admin get to change content, change pages, but they also get to administer their group. 
they get to see who's on their group, who, um, they, and so as you can see, this, they're selecting their groups below. So they're, they're actually selecting their group tree here. They can actually see all the data of all the people that are in their group. And not only that, but they have the ability to communicate to those people. They can, they can say, you know what, I want to compose a message to everyone in my group to tell them practice is canceled. And, not, and once they hit send, everyone in their group not only will get an email, but they'll also get a text message um, and whatever else they set up as their notification settings. So it's an extremely powerful tool. And there is another aspect to the website that, I, that I'm not going to uh, go over just because I couldn't necessarily find a demo version of it, but we do have a store part of our website to where people register for your group and the group admin has a complete back end of managing their finances for their group space. A lot of power here, a lot of uh, software that they, are gonna that they are able to have. Now, a big question and a big thing that's amazing is everything that I've talked to you about is free. Everything that we do and everything that you get when you join all players, from managing your groups, you get your own website, we host it for you. We are your IT department. We make sure that it's online 100% of the time. We, um, uh, we do all of these things for you, but we do it for free. And this is a really big thing about open source. And whenever you're actually starting off a business, um, this is a really big question. Like, how in the world do you make money by giving software away for free? And this is a big question with open source. And so from this point forward, I'm going to talk about that. Um, I've, I've already given you an intro of what All Players is and what we've done and what we're actually providing for free. But what, what is really fascinating to me is how we can do that and how you can form a business model around giving something away for free, such as software. And this is what open source is all about and this is why all players has the open source business model now whenever you give something away for free whenever a company and, and whenever we tell people whenever they join our site and we say yeah all of this is free the first thing they ask us is what is the catch how in the world can you provide all of this stuff for free well, how, why are you hosting it for me at least let me pay a part of your hosting bill or your IT department for managing it they don't understand how or why we would, we would actually give it away. In fact, they, they interpret it as something completely different. They interpreted it as almost charity, as us just giving it to them because we, it's the right thing to do. Now, keep in mind, a big part of open source is altruism. And I do not want to downplay altruism at all because a big, significant part of, of open source is altruism. In fact, Drupal is here because Dries was altruistic and just gave it to a community. He had no idea that people would be founding their business models on this free and open source software. But let me make a, let me make a point, which is open source isn't completely driven by altruistic motivations. By giving something away for free, you are opening up doors of other opportunities. In fact, a lot of companies, they associate contri contribution to open source as a 100% charitable action. They, it, they consider it a write-off. They say, okay, if I'm going to give this software away, that is a loss for us, so I can write this off, and it's, it's a complete write-off. But what they don't understand is the power and the, amount of and the amount of community that you get from those open source contributions. And the reason why they feel that way is because they're kind of locked into this old and classic model for software. Now, this is a very complex model. I, I, I am giving you a very simplified version of this. But I'm only doing this to, to kind of get a point across. In fact, everyone in this room, this is the business summit. Everyone in here knows about this. But I'm just showing this to kind of illustrate what happens. So in the classic, the classic business model for software, you offer something for a price. Here is something that we worked really hard on our company, we spent millions of dollars developing this, which all players we have, we've spent millions of dollars developing our software. It's worth something. And it is worth something for people. They want to buy it. And so you put a price tag on it. 
And you say, here is how much money that we want for this. And for that, you're going to get some takers. You're going to get some people that say, you know what, that is valuable. I'm going to pay money for that, and I'm going to do that. So you get adoption. Now, your rate of adoption, your price, they kind of, they fall into their, their little, um, the, their own levels. And from that, you generate revenue. So this is the classic model for software. They, you, you sell something, you get people that buy it, and from that, you generate revenue. Now, what happens if we lower the price? Well, if you lower the price, your adoption may go up. And you know what? If your, adopt, if your adoption goes up enough, you're going to start making more revenue. Now, there is a point where it peaks. If you drop the price enough, the revenue starts to go down again. And this is where people start to get afraid, where businesses, they, this starts happening, and they go, whoa, 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 pull back on the reins. We're losing revenue. We've got to stop that. We've got to rate, put the price back up. And the reason is, is because they associate this direct correlation. At this point, once the price starts dropping as, or once the revenue starts dropping as you start dropping the price, in their mind there is this direct correlation between those two, when really there isn't. And I'm, I'm going to explain how that is. And so, because there's this direct correlation, in their head, they're saying if we drop that price down to nothing, our revenue goes down to nothing as well. And so, this is why people are locked in to the non-open source business models is because this happens. They, when this starts happening, they get afraid and they're like, okay, this is not what we want. But what happens when we make it just free? When we say, you know what, you don't have to pay any money for this. Well, when you make it free, something magical happens. There is something magic about free. Just by saying, you don't have to pay anything for it, just there's something in our psychological just makeup where when you say this is free, you don't have to pay for it, we all get really excited and adrenaline just starts pumping through our, our blood and, and we, get, we get excited about it. So when you make it free, the adoption obviously goes up. You're going to get a lot of people that are like, yeah, I'll, I'll sign up for that if it's free. But because of that adoption, I put some question marks around that revenue because it becomes kind of this unknown. Your revenue becomes this unknown thing because you're not charging money for software anymore. What happens to your revenue? Well, a lot of people at this point, they, they, they're completely focused on the price and revenue that they completely ignore adoption. And what they don't realize is that adoption is so powerful if you know how to use it. And so what I'm going to talk about next is leveraging adoption for profitability. How can you leverage adoption to make your business profitable, to make uh, massive amounts of revenue? And what I'm going to uh, discuss is you're going to find out that you can actually become more profitable than if you were just charging for the, the software to begin with. So let me talk a little bit about opportunities from high adoption. So whenever you make your software free, your adoption skyrockets, you open yourself, you open up a lot of doors for business. The first one of those is you offer support. So a lot of companies, they'll say, okay, uh, because this is free, in fact, all the old, the old software, if you, you, know, you bought Microsoft Windows, you paid for it and you expected support from that. In fact, on the back of the software box, you would get, hey, if you're having problems, call this and we have people standing by 24-7 where Microsoft paid for those people to stand by 24-7. Well, whenever you offer your software for free, you can, if you want to, charge for support. And some people do. At All Players, we don't charge for support. If people have problems with their software, we've decided, you know what, we're still going to offer free support because we are going to make money in other ways, and I'll, I'll explain that. You can also provide services. Now, a lot of times you will see that whenever a company comes out with an open source software, they will also provide the hosted version of this software. You know, they, you can actually host this yourself. You can actually set this up yourself. But if you just don't want to hassle with that, we provide a service where we host this for you. And that's surprisingly very enticing for a lot of people using it. They, they don't want to deal. They don't want to mess with it. So they'll, they'll take your services. There's also customizations. 
So let's say you are the expert, you come out with this open source software. In order to make it open source, you have to make it generic so that it can conform to a lot of different scenarios. And so as your clients want something, every business is different. They are going to want a customized version of what you've, what you've provided. And who are they going to contact for you to provide the customization? They're going to contact you. There's also consultation. So now at all players, we, we do a, a little bit of the, the previous two. So one service that all players provides is in order to set up a group, it, it requires you to read our docs. You have to set up the group and you have to get everything configured and you have to you know, set up all your registration. And that may be kind of um, difficult for people just now diving in. So we offer like these consultations where people pay us we consult them to how to, here's how you set up the group, and we walk them through it, and they pay us for that. And because our adoption is so high, the amount of people that need that is, is surprisingly a lot. Affiliations. This is another big thing that a lot of people don't uh, uh, think about, is that you can make a lot of money by being affiliated with another service that does, that does um, ask for money. Like a great example is, uh, this is uh, affiliations I think is kind of the distribution model. A lot of companies come out with distributions and they will actually say, uh, while you're installing the distribution, they might say, um, you know, would you like to host your files locally or would you like to use Amazon CDN to host your files? And, uh, and all, all, the, all the person has to do is say, yeah, I'd like to use Amazon CDN. And if they sign up an account, well, the, the people that own the distro have an affiliation with Amazon CDN, so for every sign up, they get a kickback. And so even, even at all players, we have this as well. We have an affiliation with background checks. So what we've done is because we have like coaches and all of these um, people and we, we deal with kids, parents are going to want to know background checks on coaches. And so we've set up affiliations with background checks to say, hey, do you want this coach to have a background check and have that public public on your group? And if so, we per, we we sell background checks, and we get a kickback for that. Um, tangible product sales. Now I, I I put tangible there because I'm meaning something that they can actually hold. People don't expect to pay uh, you to give them an actual you know something that they can hold for free. In fact, that's pretty rare. If you're going to sell something that's tangible to them, they're going to expect to pay for it. And of course, you can take a little bit of uh, top off the top of that. And this is also a big avenue for all players because we're involved in sports. How cool would it be to sign your little kid up for soccer? And on the page of registration, we're like, hey, you know, this, this group requires you to have a soccer ball. But hey, we'll deliver it to your door. In fact, you can check out during your registration process. So this whole time, I've been talking about free. I've been talking about you offering your software for free. And no, nowhere did I even mention open source. And a lot of people, they actually associate free with open source. They make this direct connection between the two. And surprisingly, there really isn't much connection between free and open source. You can make something free and not open source and vice versa. You can actually charge money for open source. That's completely legal. But what happens when you make something open source? So let's say you did, you did contribute, you're giving away your software for free, but what if you decide, you know what, not only am I gonna make my software free, I'm gonna open source it. So that anybody can see what our technology is made of, they can build on top of it, they can improve it, they can even take it and use it for their own needs if they want to. Something else dramatic happens when you do this. So when you con uh, contribution to open stores, it boosts adoption by bringing in the community aspect into your software. So the great example here is Drupal. What makes Drupal so powerful, in my opinion, is its community. You can compare Drupal to any CMS out there. And one thing that Drupal has that no other CMS has is the, just this massive community that not only supports it, but they, they love it, they, they mold it, they make it better, they make it more powerful, they make it more flexible, they make it for everyone. And it's a, this powerful community, and because of that, that boosts adoption. So let's say you open source a piece of software that your company uses, and another company, your competitor, is like, wow, that's, that's pretty cool, we're going to, uh, to adopt that. 
you now become the expert. And they come to you, and not only will they take your, your technology, but they will boost the adoption for your platform in the process. In higher earnings, the revenue that's generated from that adoption, those go to the experts. And that's something to keep in mind. And here's something even more, uh, more important to keep in mind. When you open source your software, you suddenly become the expert. You are the go-to person that everyone who uses your software goes to to, make, to say, you know what, I want you to, to help me with this because you are the expert. And so, as you can see, the revenue just keeps getting propped up here. You're, you're, you're constantly making money. In fact, there's, a, there's a, many companies in Drupal that are experts at this. Um, I, I, I'm going to give an example. Like, Acquia is, was named one of the fastest growing companies in the U.S., because they've adopted the open source business model and their revenue is propped up because they are the experts. They, um, they're not the only experts. I'm not, I'm not going to say that they're the only experts. There's a lot of, a, of a, other experts. But they contribute to, open, to Drupal. They help with the, the new D8 initiatives. And I'm going to talk about that later in this presentation. So yeah, the, the, the higher earnings go to the experts. <laughs> Now here's a couple of questions that people ask themselves, and this is what keeps people from open sourcing. Um, a lot of them are scared um, because of these questions. If we open source our software, won't our competitors use it to their advantage? In fact, every time that I talk to a, a business who's thinking about open sourcing, um, this is the question they ask, almost always. Why would I do that? Why in the world would I open source it if my competitor can take it and they can use it to their advantage. And I think it's important to answer this question by basically saying to look at this as two different perspectives. So whenever you open source software, there are two people that, that you have to think about here. Whenever you open source software, this is how you perceive it. You perceive it as you are literally giving a chunk of your business, your hard work, your, all of the, your labor, you are giving it to your competitor. And all your competitors are like, yeah, I'm going to be able to take this. I'm going to profit from it. Yeah, big win for all of us. So that's how you perceive it. But let me, let me say something. Whenever, let's say your competitor is in the same situation as you are, they, they have a piece of software that's very similar to yours. They make money off of it. They, their entire business foundation is built on top of that piece of software. In fact, they may even charge money for it. If that is the case, you coming out and open sourcing and making your version of it free and open to the, to the public, this is how they perceive it. You are quite literally knocking the feet out from underneath them. And if their entire business model is founded on a piece of software that you are open sourcing and they rely on that for their revenue, they are vulnerable. Which is also something to keep in mind for you whenever you're developing your software. I'm not saying it's, it's bad to keep software as closed source. There's many, many cases where you probably need to and it's okay to charge money for software. I am in no way saying that. What I'm saying is, if you are a business and you have a piece of software that you rely on being closed source and, and making revenue from that, if your business is dependent on that, you are vulnerable. Because the reason why you're vulnerable is because if you don't open source it, somebody else will. And that is the nature of open source. And so you have to say to yourself, if, if I don't open source this thing that my business depends on and somebody else does, what is it going to do to me? And and you have to think about that. And the reason why this will scare your competitors so much is because you are forcing them to make two decisions here. And this is black and white. It's about as black and white as I can make it. They decide to adopt your open source software or they decide to not adopt your open source software. That is black and white. They can either take it or leave it. Okay? And I think both of those scenarios are interesting. So I'm going to talk about that. Let's say they adopt. Well, they will be forced, first of all, they'll be forced to change their business model to adopt because they're adopting your open source software. They're going to have to change their business model to reflect that. The next thing is, is you become the expert. I've already talked about this. You get the leg up on them because they adopt your open source software. You become the expert. How much time do I have?
Is, is it supposed to be 9.30 is when this is over? Um, and also, you will have a leading voice for first future versions of your software and develop superior strategies before they are realized. A lot of people don't realize how powerful that can really be, is that you are able to see what's coming and you're able to modify your business strategies around that. Okay. And then the next thing I want to talk about is you will ride the wave of massive adoption. There's this thing that, that I like to talk about whenever I give these presentations, and I call it the wave of adoption. And this is kind of visualized as a graph. On the y-axis, you have adoption, which we, we've talked about. And on the x-axis, you have software versions. Now, as it may go, in, in the case of Drupal, Drupal is a classic example. I want everyone to think of this in terms of Drupal. In Drupal, there is this adoption wave that, that occurs. So everyone jumps on the latest version. But not only that, but everyone, including more people, jump on the latest version because it's the latest version. They're going to try it out. And so what you get is you get a lot of people that first come on. The adoption rate uh, for that version is massive. And it kind of trickles down a little bit as the versions go down. So like the Drupal, Drupal 4, the Drupal 5, the adoption is really, really low. Drupal 7 is just way up there. But you have to think of this as like a moving wave. And not only is it a moving wave, it's getting bigger. Okay, So then there's this dramatic drop off after 7 because that's, that's unstable. That's beta. People don't want to get on beta. They, they want to be on the stable, latest, and greatest version. And so it really does look like this, this massive wave. I like to think of it like that. And so whenever, whenever you uh, think about who's using Drupal, who are the experts, who, what, what are they doing, you, you really can classify them as two different people. You have the consumers of open source and you have the producers of open source. The consumers are on the other side of this wave. They're, they're over here. They're using it. They're consuming. They're taking. They're, uh, they are, uh, which is perfectly fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying you're missing out on opportunity if you do that. So here they are. They're, they're consuming open source. In fact, there's a lot of Drupal shops that, um, you know, the, they, they wait until the latest version of Drupal comes out and then they're like, okay, we got to become experts at this. Now that it's out, we got to become experts. And they do that, and but they don't contribute back, but they become experts, and they're a Drupal shop, and that is their foundation, is by, become, by being consumers of open source. However, on the other side of the wave, on the beta, the people who are involved with beta, the people who are involved with alpha, these are the people who are producers of open source, and they are, they are looked at as the innovators. These are the people who are defining the next direction for um, for open source. In Drupal, this is a whole slew of companies. There are a lot of dev shops um, that do this, that are the producers of open source, that contribute. Um, I, I, I don't want to name, name them because they're everyone, pretty much every company that's involved in this, this conference is one of these. They, are, they help contribute back to Drupal to make it better. Now, a really cool thing happens you are looked at as an industry leader if you are on that side. And the reason why is because by the time the wave even gets to you, by that time that crest of adoption gets to you, you're already an expert because you helped build it. And so because of that, because you are already an expert in the industry, you get to take full advantage of the crest of adoption. And so the key here is, is to not necessarily see yourself as, hey, you know, I'm going to become an expert at Drupal 7. Learn Drupal 8. Get out there and figure out what's going on and see if you can contribute back to it. Because by the time that that comes around, you will be, excuse me, you will be the expert. So let's talk about the other situation here. Let's talk about what if your com our competitor doesn't adopt and they move in their own direction. Well, let's look at a real-life situation. I think you see where this is going. This is a real life situation where, where one company open source something and another company is like, you know what, that's cool, you can do that, but we got ours, we think it's better, we're going to go in our own direction. In 2008, Google took a leap of faith by releasing Android as open source. And I really want to highlight that. They took a leap of faith. They had no idea how it was going to turn out. 
but they completely open sourced Android as a leap of faith. And that's what it was. It was a leap of faith. And so they released it in 2008 when iOS was already a dominating market leader. Google led the Open Handset Alliance uh, to form open specs for mobile devices. So they, they formed a community around it. That's what the Open Handset Alliance was. It, it was the community version of Android. And they had a lot of takers. And Apple OS at the, at, uh, at, the, at the time, I mean even today, they still maintain their proprietary operating system and they're controlled solely by Apple. And, it does not and, they, and also Apple does not belong to the Open Handset Alliance. So they, they didn't jump aboard. They said, we're going to do this on our own. So here's what happens when that, that occurs. And I'm not saying this happens all the time. This, this is kind of a radical case, but this could happen. So many of Google's competitors adopted Android, thus teaming up against Apple OS. And what you ended up with is this. Google drew the line in the sand and said, you know what? You, can, you, you don't have to come over here. But if you do, you will have an advantage. And so they had a lot of takers. A lot of people were like, yeah, this is awesome. We get our own app store. We get, we get to take advantage of, of all of these things. And Google made it free because they were interested in adoption. That's all they were concerned with. They wanted that adoption. Why did they want, excuse me, why did they want that adoption? They, I think it's obvious, the app store, their, the Google Play store. That's where they make their money. But they get that from adoption. And so, so here's what actually happened when this occurred. You can see that, that Android started off. Uh, Android's blue, iOS is red. And they started off way below Apple. Apple's still kind of gradually going. But look what's happening to, to uh, Android. It is, it's kind of like the exponential growth here. And they're doing this because of strategy. Open sourcing your software has nothing to do with, I mean, of course, it has a lot to do with altruism. You do it because it feels right. It's the right thing to do. But also do it because it gives you the, the, a, a strategy advantage over your competitors. And they and now Apple's kind of shaking. I'm not saying they're shaking in their boots because they're not. They, don't, they probably don't even care about Android. But Android is something that they definitely are thinking about and they're definitely concerned about. Um, so Google took advantage of the symbiotic relationships incurred from their open source contribution. I'm going to spend the last part talking about um, symbiotic relationships um, because I feel like that is a great thing and it also maps to open source. So symbiotic relationships. I actually learned about this from my four-year-old. That's what's amazing. He, he watches this show called PBS Kids. I think it's called Wild Kratts. Any of you guys have kids, you probably know what this is. I actually love this show. It's awesome. But I was sitting at the dinner table one day, and my four-year-old like, looked up, and he's like, Dad, do you know that a, a suckerfish and a shark have a symbiotic relationship with each other? I mean, this literally came out of my four-year-old's mouth. And I, my, my jaw dropped, and I was like, what? Symbiotic relationship? So I did some research on what symbiotic relationships are. And come to find out, they are almost exactly what happens in open source. So let's talk about what it means. So in nature, two or more species depend on one another for either survival or mutual lifestyle betterment. So a great example is the suckerfish and the shark. So the suckerfish, they, they remove like all these, um, the, 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 the things that, the disgusting things that grow on sharks and they're constantly cleaning the shark. And the shark provides those <laughs> the shark just doesn't eat them, <laughs> is, what, is, is the betterment that they get. They, they don't get um, eaten by, so they get protection. And so in nature, you find this a lot all over the place. And it would only be natural to make that, as, that association between symbiotic relationships to actual business, to open source business. And in open source, symbiotic relationships perfectly describe how two or more companies leverage each other for mutually increased profits. Now, you can have this. You can have symbiotic relationships from two companies that, that are, are closed source, from Apple's. They, they, companies do this all the time. What all I'm saying is open, whenever you have an open source business model, you depend on these. You need these, these relationships to survive because it's very important. So let's look at an example. So Google needed an, a phone for their Android, whereas Samsung needed a popular OS for their phones. This is, this is the 
a very simple um, example. And so what you got was you got this. You got the Samsung Galaxy S3, which Apple is suing the heck out of because they're scared. So that's what you get. You get an amazing product. And each one of these companies are boosting their revenue because of each other. And that is the symbiotic relationship. So it, at all players, we also have these symbiotic relationships. Now there's, there's a whole lot more than I can, I can talk about at the current moment because there's some that are kind of currently in, in process. But the ones that I can talk about, um, so at quickscores.com, we've actually partnered with, and we provide group and user management. They provide advanced scheduling. So they get, they get more schedules generated. We get more membership. Credit card processing. We provide high quantities of charges. They provide us with lower rates. So this is, the, this is collective buying power. This is why Walmart can charge so low for their stuff is because they have this massive buying power and companies know that if they want to sell a lot of their stuff, they're going to have to knock down those prices. And so credit card companies do, do that with us. And what's amazing is our business model is founded on that where we take that, we take that, um, that discount and we fill it in with our own service charge during registration. And that's a big P, that's a big part of how we make money. And the group doesn't notice much of a change in what they would normally pay. Symbiotic relationships really create this win-win for everyone, if you know how to do it cor correctly. Um, equipment dealers. We provide online checkout uh, convenience for their customers. They give us lower rates on goods. Uh, background checks. I, I kind of covered over this a little bit. We provide huge demand for their products, and they provide us with an affiliate light kickback. And so there's many, many more. And so because of this, our business model is founded on forming these symbiotic relationships to where we can get discounted prices because of who we are. And we, in turn, make money off of that by kind of filling in the gaps here and there. Like the credit card processing is, is a great example. Like, during, like if, a, if you're a parent, you're registering your kid for your group, you're going to walk through registration. You're not going to pay any more than you normally would. You're not going to pay a, an, all, a, an all players service fee. Um, you're going to pay what you normally would, what the group charges. The group is because the credit card companies are giving us a lower rate, the group is not, is, and we fill in the gap with a, um, our charge. We still make money off that processing while the group admin, has he doesn't notice much difference. These symbiotic relationships can be very powerful if used in the right way. So let me just kind of just recap on the open source business model before, before I end. So the open source business model goes like this. You provide the software for free. You contribute software back to the community. So you give back. You make it free. You give. You, um, you embrace the, uh, the spirit of open source. And then you leverage large adoption to generate revenue. So you can do that from registration fees, tangible products during registration. These are all pertain to us. But you leverage large adoption through those symbiotic relationships that are incurred from that large adoption. So really that adoption opens many, many doors. And so this is really exciting. It's, it's an exciting model to have. Again, I do want to make a disclaimer that this is, I am not in any way saying this is the only way to go. If you're not doing this and you're successful, then I say that's awesome. All I'm saying is, is that it's, it's really exciting to take the values of open source and map them directly onto your business. And I, I, I believe me, you will notice significant boost in not only your morale. So as a developer working for this company, I love it because their business model is open source. Um, so you boost morale. It just it makes you feel good because you are giving, and by that giving you are you are getting um, higher profits. It's a win win for everyone. So that's it for me, guys. Um, oh, one last thing, and because we make our software free, our revenue is only limited by our own creativity. And what I mean by that is, the sky is the limit, really. You can make as much money as, as things you can come up with. The, there are new symbiotic relationships everywhere. You just have to be creative. 
and come up with ways to, to, see, to, to recognize and identify how people are using your software and say, you know what, if I, made, if, I did the, if I provided this service, their life would be that much easier. And by taking that, by, by looking at that, you are opening up another door to make even more revenue. Whereas you wouldn't be able to do that is if you charge money for that software because they would just expect those services. So you, you, it really does um, it require creativity on everyone's part. So it's really, really great. So that's it for me, guys. Uh, does anybody have any questions?